I remember when this was done with a slideshow, I would take the slides down to Walgreens. I would develop them. I'd put them in a carousel and I'd talk in person in a class. But that was a long time ago. Good Friday morning, friends, uh, and welcome to the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist. My name is Tim, and I will be your host this week. Uh, and there are a few things that I'm thinking about as I look over the neighborhood from my second floor window, as we are experiencing the blizzard of 2024. Um, first of all, it's absolutely beautiful outside. Um, I'm amazed that some of our viewers who are just a few miles away have no snow and rain, but we have Plenty of snow here by Washington Park. Um, I'm excited to be able to go sledding and skiing and take winter hikes and all the fun things that Wisconsin winters bring us. Um, second, I'm thinking of the ecological community, our backyard ecological community and others, the wildlife, the plants, the animals that are benefiting from this snow here in the upper Midwest. Um, the badly needed subnivian layer is finally forming that, that so many critters depend on. And then I'm finally thinking... You know, what else I love about Backyard Naturalists is that we don't need to check the news to see if it's canceled, uh, like I did for my lovely little cherubs that are going to be home with me all day. And I'm excited about that because the Backyard Naturalist, with a minuscule amount of exceptions, is always here with us. Rain or shine, blizzard or heat advisory, just like the post office, uh, we deliver through rain, snow, sleet, and hail. Um and I was totally am and was and will be totally intrigued by today's group, the muscles. Um, I don't know. I, I, we're, we're here because we share a fascination with wildlife uh, and and learning. And that's why we get together and, and learn about all of this great stuff. Uh, and this critter for me represents a little bit of a conundrum because we are surrounded by muscles. I mean, some of us more than others, right? But really, we are their muscles are everywhere around the globe. Um, probably not in your backyards. I don't want to make that assumption. But if you go to the nearest waterway, there's muscles around. And we see them. But I think subjectively speaking, uh, I think I would go out and, and venture to say they're mostly overlooked. If Maybe not if you're at a tidal pool. And you're looking for a lot of cool critters, you might see the mussels. Um, and I don't want to speak for everyone, but we're usually gravitating towards the the fish and the crabs and the lobsters and basically things that move around. Um, the mussels are kind of like finding a cool rock, um, but you then you put it back, and that's that's all you get. Or sometimes you can't even pick them up depending on where they are because they're attached to rocks. So, you know, when we go invertebrate sampling here. Uh, through urban ecology center programs where we tend to and again i'm not speaking for everybody we tend to marvel at the crayfish and the insect larvae and we find mussels but they don't draw our attention in the same way um, because to our eye they're really not doing anything um, so there are definitely muscle enthusiasts out there and i'm not you know i'm not saying we all are in this category but i i think in the general psyche of the population, even among naturalists, muscles just tend to be there. Um, I know they're important, but we don't see them doing much. They're not breaching or frolicking. Um, and that's exactly why I knew that not only did I have to learn more about them, but then I was sure that I would become fascinated by them once I did. And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, and I'm pretty sure it will happen to you too. So Sit back, relax from the comfort of your screen on this blizzardy January day as we bring you episode 20 of season five, uh, which is also the 201st episode of the Backyard Naturalist Muscle Beach Party. And yes, I still haven't really learned how to work with images on Google, but consider this a hearkening back to the early days when I didn't really learn how to work with images on PowerPoint either. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting the Backyard Naturalist. Hopefully you also support your local PBS, PBS station uh, since we borrow their regular tagline weekly. And a huge thank you to those of you who can support this program uh, with your subscription. We are ever grateful for your financial support. Those of you can and choose to, we are almost halfway through the season and we're starting to reflect on what season six might look like. Um, and we hope you continue with us on this journey. If you're already a subscriber, thank you. Tell a friend about the program. 
Yeah, your subscription keeps the program free to those who may not be able to support us financially, and it supports the Urban Ecology Center's mission of connecting people in cities to nature and to each other. So here we go. Muscles. What are they? Who are they? Why are they? The biology book tells me that they're an animal. But it's really hard for my pattern seeking brain to look at these things and say, oh, yeah, those are animals. Um, my brain wants to say those are strange looking rocks. They might be alive, but animals are things that move around and, and eat things and play. And and so I kind of have to turn off that part of my brain and think, OK, they are animals just like I'm an animal. They fit the criteria. They grow from embryos, they eat, they reproduce sexually, they breathe, they poop. Um, so I I just need to turn off my biases and accept them and appreciate them as animals. In fact, mussels belong to a phylum of critters that my brain easily recognizes as animals. And we visited this phylum uh, a couple of years ago. We had a backyard naturalist on, on our wonderful backyard slugs, the garden slugs. And, and we get into a little bit more about what makes a mollusk a mollusk. So you can, you know, rewind, catch an old episode. You can stream old episodes on the Urban Ecology Center's YouTube channel. Um, and the mollusk phylum, uh, which includes the mussels, contains some of the coolest, some of the most intelligent animals on the planet, uh, even though they're way not related to us, and and some of the most deadliest animals, uh, like the, the blue ringed octopus, um, in fact, arguably the most venomous animal on earth is, isn't a snake or a spider. It's a cone shell, which is a mollusk. Um, but unlike the slugs and the snails and the octopuses, um, thank you, Mike Larson, for reminding me that octopuses is the correct for, plural form of octopus. Um, the mussels bring us, our backyard naturalist community, into a new order of animals that we haven't really studied before. So that is the bivalves. And the, the etymology here is pretty straightforward. Bi means two, and valve has its root in Latin, and it means doors. So bivalves translate as two doors, as members of this class have two hinged shells and include some very familiar and very tasty, in my opinion, groups of animals like clams and oysters, scallops, and cockles which I haven't eaten, but I hear are tasty. Um, and then, so when I look at the members of this class, uh, this is where my brain again says, these aren't animals. And I think one of the other reasons I don't look at them as animals is because they're lacking a fairly important body part ahead. So it's hard for my brain to something to, to call something an animal if it doesn't have a head and doesn't do all those other things. Because, you know, Snails have heads, cockroaches have heads. So this headless class of animals, um, for the most part, they're, 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 they're filter feeders. They either bury themselves into the sediment or they attach themselves to rocks or both. Sometimes they're able to burrow into even hard surfaces like stones and rocks. Um, some, some can swim like scallops, but for the most part, they are fairly sedentary. Um, there's about... A hundred, there's a hundred families of bivalves, and we estimate about 20,000 current species. And what we call a mussel is fairly arbitrary and depending on where you live. So even though there's this whole group of bivalves, um, we, we tend to group them based on what we see. So uh, even though they're not necessarily related, um, they're in both freshwater and the saltwater habitats, uh, we tend to look at this group and say, okay, the group on the left is a little more round, a little more symmetrical, so we'll call them a clam. The group on the right is a little more oblong, a little more oval, a little more asymmetrical, so we'll call them muscles. In general, that's kind of what we tend to do when we call them um, things, at least in our culture. Um, it's, it's not a biological classification, it's a cultural one, and it also changes when it's a culinary one, and it changes for biological reasons, reasons too. So when mussels do come cooked as an appetizer, uh, we de generally don't see one of their most important anatomical structures, which are these bissel threads, they're called, and, and, and some e even chefs will call them the beard, and they're removed. Um, 
but the, the Bissell threads are used as a firm attachment to substrates. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then, like I said, the, in the cooking process, they're removed. So I guess we don't know if they're tasty or not. Um, but that's an important part to, for an animal that can't really swim around very much. Um, and he's e either going to stay tight or is going to move around. These Bissell threads kind of help it move like little tiny arms, um, like little tiny starfish arms or something like that. Uh, these same Bissell threads kind of look like a spider web and can be used a little bit like a spider web. So they can be used as a defense mechanism against predatory mollusks like dog whelks, which are a, a type of shell that love to go into mussel beds. And basically, it, it's like a, a, a huge spread for them and uh, they can invade. But the, the mussels have this really interesting way of defending themselves. They will they will basically shoot these Bissell threads out um, a little bit like Spider-Man, but much, much, much more slowly. And this will not only save the life of the muscle that shoots it out, sometimes one one or two might be sacrificed in this process, but uh, but oftentimes these threads that these little muscles shoot out will immobilize the snail and end up killing it. So they can't get any more uh, muscles. So it's kind of like an action movie on a very, very slow scale. But hey, you know, I, I didn't realize muscles could do that, could defend themselves by shooting out webs. Um, and then probably the most obvious body part of a muscle is that hard outer shell, which which it grows on its own. It doesn't move into it. it the baby muscles grow little baby shells, and then they just kind of grow. They need that calcium to grow. And the thickness of that shell often correlates with the density of predators. So muscles are good at detecting the presence of what's in the water through pheromones, just like a, a moth will use those antenna to detect pheromones and what's around in the air. Uh, muscles can detect pheromones of what's it's around it in the water, even though it doesn't have eyes. And so if there is a high density of predators, the muscles can detect that. And, um, and then they will, in that population, invest more energy into their shell to make a thicker shell. Could be the same species, uh, different population, just a little bit farther away where there's very few predators, and those individual muscles will invest less in their shell because they don't really have to. Um, so for the most part, the they're, they tend to be darker on the outside. Um, and, you know, for for an animal that doesn't move much or at all or or even or very quickly, uh, it essentially then behaves like a rock and it presents this nice dark or nice um, hard surface for other animals to colonize. So you'll often see barnacles hitching a ride on the mussels. Barnacles, another group of headless animals, which aren't even mollusks, they're arthropods, uh, more closely related to crabs and lobsters. So just trying to throw our brains in for a loop, but we'll, we'll, we'll get this. Um, so when the dark hinged shells open, the insides reveal a very, I mean, object, subjectively beautiful, silvery, iridescent, it's called a nacreous layer. That's my word for the day, nacreous. And, and nacreous means having the luster of mother of pearl. Um, so you just get that. You can kind of, your, your brain can look at that and say, yeah, that's pearly. Um, but you can say it's nacreous. And speaking of pearls, I think a lot of people associate oysters with pearls and not mussels. But, um, and, and I think that's what we're used to. But some of the most valuable natural pearls come from freshwater mussels in particular. The, so the ones that we have here in Wisconsin can produce some of the most sought after pearls um, for the industry, for the pearl industry. The two hinged valves are joined on the outside by a ligament, and then they can be opened and closed very forcefully by a strong set of internal muscles. So in the, in the picture in the upper right, you can see that kind of scallopy looking white part is a is a muscle that's very strong and can pull it open. So when we take kids out uh, looking for um, invertebrates, aquatic, aquatic invertebrates, we often find mussels. And um, even though I don't, you know, encourage us too much, you can't really, I wouldn't try too hard, but you can't really pry those open. Those are those are really stuck tight, stuck tight because of that very strong set of muscles that keeps the two shelves together. And then so in order to open it, 
um, for study or for cooking, you actually have to cut that muscle. So in the in the bottom picture, you can kind of see the 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 two halves of muscles after they've been cut. Um, so the the kind of two round white areas near the top are the muscles 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 the anyway. So the shell the shell itself supports and protects all that inner tissue. It protects it from predators. Um, it also protects the muscle from drying out. If the water level in the river would go down and they need to spend some time in the air, or probably more obviously if they're in tidal flats and the water levels are fluctuating, um, that strong muscle will create a nice seal that will um, keep the insides from drying out for, for quite a long time. So this is an image that then finally helped convince my brain that yes, a muscle is an animal. And what I see here is a snail-like animal. So now I'm able to kind of think, okay, um, I still see a headless snail, but it's a snail. And um, again, we don't normally see these things happening, but that just like a snail, a muscle has a very, you know, uh, beefy muscle in the middle that's called the foot, just like the snail walks around on a foot. The muscle also has a foot. Um, we like to eat that foot. Uh, Again, many different species of mussels take many different forms. So some, some are firmly anchored pretty much throughout their life, and they use those bristle threads permanently. Um, some use the bristle threads as kind of a temporary or you know short-term anchor while it's able to move pretty slowly again through the substrate. These things are not going to break any kind of speed records, um, but they, they are able to move along uh, like a good animal with that foot. And um, it's just, again, slow action movie. And then this diagram also shows the feeding mechanisms. So they do eat, just like good animals. They're filter feeders, uh, feeding mainly on plankton and other tiny creatures. Um, so they draw water in through the in-current siphons. And then that goes through the brachial chamber, chamber, which are essentially modified gills. Uh, the food is funneled into the mouth. And then the wastewater exits through the excurrent siphon, the, the pooping siphon. So that's it's a filter feeder. It doesn't have a, a lot of options of what they can eat. It's just kind of like whatever's on the table is what I'm going to eat. Um, so they can't be too too choosy, too picky. But, you know, in a, in a healthy stream of water, there's a lot of good diversity of plankton. I'm sure some of it is yummy. Uh, unfortunately for the mussels, too, if there's pollutants in the water, they just kind of have to eat those, too. So they're kind of at the mercy for whatever is in the water, which is why they, they can be bioindicators of healthy streams. Um, if the stream gets too polluted, you're, you're going to start to lose the mussels because they're going to be poisoned by, they just got to eat what's in the water. They, they don't have a choice. Um, and then that's different usually from the marine, the intertidal mussels, uh, because those, I mean, they're also filter feeders, but uh, they're, they're kind of, all clumped together in colonies. And the colonies help in a couple of ways. First of all, you know, this this might be pounded with waves constantly, consistently. And so being together kind of uh, huddled as a mass helps helps keep them attached to the rock. Um, but it also then will, uh, when the tide, tides go down or the waves go down, this, this mass colony of mussels will also then trap little water, little water puddles, little water droplets, which help them uh, keep from drying out because, you know, a tropical system like this, once the water goes down, there could be some hot, hot, hot sun for a long time until the next tide comes in. Uh, so these living together like this, which is, you know, different from, for the most part, different from our freshwater mussels we have here, you'll, you'll find them very tightly packed together. And not all mussels are either these freshwater mussels or these tidal mussels. They they live everywhere. They live in depths. So there's even a, a, a genus of mussels called Beth bathymodiolus, so bathymetry, the, the, the deep. Um, and they're found in deep, deep, deep sea. They're, they're found uh, even in the hydrothermal vents, uh, filtering the sulfur that comes up out of the vents, so in, in deep ocean ridges. So they can be everywhere, um, and they are everywhere, uh, probably, probably not in Antarctica. And um, in case you were wondering, they, there are both um, they, they do reproduce sexually. So there's a, a male form and a female form. Fertiliz fertilization is external for the most part. Um, so a, a common muscle reproduction plan is that the males release their sperm into the water. 
the females release eggs, the eggs are fertilized in the water column, and then they just they become part of the plankton. Uh, and they, they just float around for a period of, of weeks to months, and they just kind of develop on the fly um, or on the swim. And uh, eventually, once they're developed, they settle down to live life as, as, a, as an adult muscle. So no more fun adventures in the open ocean. Kind of, uh, kind of enjoy it while you can. And you got to become a responsible adult and you're kind of stuck somewhere. Um, so here's your, your weekly fact to impress your friends. There are some species that go through a metamorphosis stage on aquatic vegetation. So before they're ready to become adults, they land on plants. And then they they metamorphize into an adult form, and then they settle down. In a really fascinating and interesting twist, um, there are many freshwater, most of the freshwater mussels, um, they, their life cycle has evolved entirely differently, so uh, mostly differently. So the, the males still release the sperm into the water, but the females don't release their eggs into the water. And, and what they do is they pull sperm into their bodies with their in-current siphon. So they're essentially eating the sperm, but the sperm aren't going to their stomach. So the food goes to the stomach, the water goes to the gills, they figure out a way to compartmentalize, and then um, the sperm goes to the area where it needs to go to, where it can fertilize the eggs. Um, and then the freshwater mussels have a stage called the glochidium. And this is where they essentially develop inside the female and then they use their little tiny little mouth to basically cl clamp on to mom now i've always thought of a clam mouth as a mouth um so and i think a lot of us do because it's not a mouth at all but if we're trying to make these things look like animals it's easy for us to say that is you know pixar does it um so i'm gonna call it i'm gonna think of it as a as a mouth and they use that little tiny, tiny baby little clam mouth to, you know, glomp onto mom and, and just kind of uh, wait there, it, basically in the gill area. And they can still develop a little bit. They can still get oxygen. They can still get what they need. Um, but they're not shout out into the open ocean like uh, a lot of mussels. So um, once all the young mussels are attached and ready, mom essentially goes fishing. So her mantle, the muscles are specialized and they essentially become fishing lures. And they, when, when they sense the presence of fish, because again, they, they can sense these pheromones, when they sense the presence of fish, mom starts making this little specialized mantle into a lure and she moves it around. Uh, she's trying to get that fish to try and bite that mantle. Um, what she's trying to do then is when the fish does bite the mantle, the fish is expecting a meal um, and the fish is surprised, not in a good way. It strikes expecting to eat. But at that moment, mom ejects all of those baby muscles into the fish's mouth uh, and, and the surrounding mouth. So there's basically a cloud of baby muscles in that fish's face. The fish is surprised, disappointed, still needs to breathe. So it's breathing in this water. Um, and then that's when those little tiny baby mollusks attach themselves, usually to the gills, sometimes the fins, but usually to the gills of the fish. They clomp on with their little baby mouths and then they tap into the fish's bloodstream. They essentially become a parasite. Sometimes they're specialized to a specific species of fish. Sometimes it's their generalist. They're just trying to get any fish. Um, and, and that's important because just as like, if we're trying to fish for something, we're going to use a specific type of lure. If we were using a worm, we're probably kind of not too much carrying what bites we just want to fish. Um, and it's the same for the mussels. If they're a generalist, they don't care what kind of fish it is. They're going to keep that lure pretty general. Um, but some fish specialize and they're, you know, these are, these are the show off mussels and, um, so essentially, this is a fish lure that is trying to, I think in this case, trying to attach, it's trying to, it, it basically this lure looks like the surrounding fish. And we're going to see this a little bit later in a video. Um, and because we can't show this video, 
for copyright reasons now, if you're watching this recorded, you can go to YouTube and enter. It's like nation, nat, natural fish lure or just go to Google and type, you know, mussels tricking fish or something like that. Um, so if it's a specialist fish, that lure might become very specialized. Fish strikes, takes all those parasites. The parasites develop on the fish. They usually don't hurt the fish. They don't, um, they don't kill the fish. Essentially, they're just uh, going for the ride. So in that upper picture, you can see just the tiny little clams. Even looks like it has a tongue there. It's not a tongue. It's a it's it's that foot muscle, um, but it basically attaches to the fish. Um, when it's ready to become a responsible adult, they drop off, find their dream location in the substrate, and turn into an adult muscle. So pretty cool adaptation for an animal that essentially pretends it's a rock. And Wisconsin has roughly 30 species of freshwater clams and about 50 species of freshwater mussels. In freshwater biology, the difference between mussels and clams doesn't have to do with the shape or anything like that. In, in the freshwater biology, we call a clam these bivalves that just go through that basic life cycle. And we call a freshwater mussel the ones that require that fish host. It's not always fish. Sometimes it's a salamander, um, but that's kind of from from a limnological perspective. That's what we that's how we differentiate between the clams and the mussels. Um, there's really not a biological dif differentiation. I, well, there is in in what we see, but it depends on how they how they go about their life. So it's not based on phenology. It's based on their lifestyle. Um, our freshwater mussels are can be stunning um you know if if you look for them and there's a lot of programs uh muscle monitoring programs out there from a community science perspective and it's it's a really if you're looking for something new to learn if you're if you're tired of the birds if you're tired of the dragonflies and you want to put something new into your naturalist uh vocabulary muscles i think would be a pretty fun one uh, to, to start learning. And, and, you know, they're, they're beautiful. Some of them are, are, I mean, subjectively beautiful and they have cool names like the, the purple warty back, the winged maple leaf, the rock pocketbook, the monkey face. Um, and unfortunately most of us probably, you know, I would, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of us don't can't, couldn't name many muscles. I'm sure some of you can, but, uh, but I'd be willing to wager that most of us can name the two non-native mussels, or at least one of the two non-native mussels that have come over here from Europe and wreaked havoc uh, to our to our ecosystem. So first came the zebra mussel, the one on top, and so named because it's striped like a zebra. And then later came the quagga mussel, uh, which is can even go to greater depths and probably has an even bigger impact. Uh, and brava for whoever named these because the quagga mussels looks like an unfortunately extinct subspecies of the zebra called the quagga. Um, so, you know, the, the zebra mussel has stripes all the way, just like the zebra has kind of stripes most all the way. And then the quagga looks like somebody just smudged the stripes in the bottom half of the zebra. And similar in the quagga mussel, it just looks like somebody just kind of smudged the stripes. So that's that's a yeah, well done, but a very unfortunate um, invader to our to our freshwater ecosystems and there's a lot of reasons it's you know and they're one of many but basically the the one of the biggest impacts they have is decimating our native mussels mussel population which they just essentially smother them and the and then the mussels will die and that's why so many of our mussels are threatened or endangered or extinct um in Wisconsin and and other parts of of North America and and they're just, you know, even if they're, you know, if you, re if you put aside the fact that they're becoming the only mussel in the area, their mussels are really good filter feeders. So that's an important part of the community that mussels provide. And in, in kind of a balanced ecosystem, they're going to, they're going to do a really good job of, of playing that filter feeder role. Um, you get all these little filter feeders and they just essentially clean house. And, you know, we, it's, it's also easy for us to look at a body of water and say, oh, it's so clear. It must be really healthy, you know, not polluted. 
Um, and sometimes that's the case, but usually what happens is it's clear for the wrong reasons. It's clear because these muscles have just taken everything out of the water, all the algae. So not only are they out competing the muscles, they're out competing the, all the other filter feeders in an ecosystem. And so it's, it's just really bad. And, and, um, there's a lot of scientists looking at, you know, what we can do, um, you know, maybe maybe part of it is figuring out how to way to get the calcium out so that they can't build their their protective shells. Um, predators in, introduce predators, which is always a really you know nerve wracking game. But uh, but what they've done is 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 uh, you know on on par greater than than white nose and bats. Um, so unrelenting damage to our freshwater ecosystems. Um, Oh, and then also from from clearing out that water, making it so clear that allows the visual predators that normally have a, you know, their prey have a little bit of an advantage if they're in some murky water. Now, all of a sudden, those visual predators can see everything and, and just start, you know, have a huge advantage over their prey. So um, I'm really glad I looked into muscles today because I had no idea just how amazing they are. Um, I knew... My, I knew that they were important as filter feeders. I knew they were important as indicators of stream health and all the stuff that we learn, the stuff you learn at the Urban Ecology Center and other places. Um, but it's it was it's just a little bit of out of sight, out of mind. I didn't see or experience this action. Um, so I don't know. Next, so next time I I come across a freshwater mussel in in a, in a lake or a river or on my dinner plate, um, it, it's going to give me pause to to really marvel at the package inside of that shell. That performs that magic, um, even in, or should I say, especially in an animal without a head. So that's the muscle. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I'll stop sharing my screen. We can watch that video.